Hello and welcome into another episode of Locked On Wolves. Today on the show, all about the big man rotation. What does what do the numbers say about Cat on the floor by himself, Rudy on the floor by himself, and the two star bigs for the Wolves on the floor together? How does Nas fit into the rotation? We'll see what the numbers say so far through 11 games this regular season. Also, I want to talk uh, the offense. A couple of things the Wolves can do now to improve their offense almost immediately. We'll also look at the Pelicans matchup on Saturday night. It's all coming on the show. Welcome in. You are Locked On Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves. Your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome to the Lockdown Wolves podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Lockdown Wolves. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Lockdown NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Happy Friday, everybody. Happy weekend. And a big thank you for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every single day. Of course, this show is is free and available everywhere, wherever you like to listen to podcasts. That includes YouTube, and you can also watch on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app, which can be found at both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. You can also follow the show on X at Lockdown T-Wolves and also at my account, which is at B-Beacon. That's with two Bs, two Es, C-K-E-N. All right, Uh, Wolves-Pelicans Saturday night. We'll talk about that at the end of the show. I want to start with some lineup data and then talk offense. Um one of the things we've all, I think speaking, speaking for everybody, I guess been interested to see this season, how Chris Finch manages the big man rotation between cat Rudy and Nas. And then what those lineup combinations ultimately look like, right? We had a small sample last year with Townsend and Rudy on the floor together. And it was decidedly mixed results, right? But we never really got to see an extended sample size. Now we're still only 11 games into the season. It was like game, 20 or 21 when cat got hurt last year. Um, but of course at the time the wolves were, I think it was game 21 and they were like 10 and 11 or something like that at the time. Obviously the wolves are off to a much better start this year, but the lineup data of them together on the floor actually isn't all that much better than last year. In general, the wolves are much better, but a lot of that's because of the staggering Chris Finch has done and how well cat and Rudy have each played without the other one on the floor. Now I've I'm on the record going back to last year on the show saying that I actually thought the Cat and Rudy chemistry, if we want to call it that, isn't actually bad. Offensively, I feel like they mesh together fairly well. Mesh isn't maybe the right word because it's not that clean, but they seem to naturally fit together a little bit better and have an understanding of each other and and where, you know, Cat trying to get the... At times, it's a little too much, Cat trying to force the ball into Rudy, but there appears to be some sort of synergy there that didn't exist at all last year between Ant and Rudy Gobert or D'Lo and Rudy Gobert, and I talked about that all the time on the show. But at the same time, the lineup data doesn't necessarily bear out that the Wolves have been super successful with those guys on the floor together. It's not bad. Um, Obviously, the Wolves are 8-3, and 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 they have the best defense in the league, even after the debacle in Phoenix on Wednesday night, even after giving up a billion points on like a hundred percent shooting, not actually, but like, I think literally 60% shooting. If I remember right. Um, actually I've got it right here. It was 60, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. 60% shooting 54.8% from three for Phoenix on Wednesday. They're still the number one defense. That's how ridiculously ahead of the number two defensive team. The wolves were at the time and, uh, are still again, the number one defense. So I want to talk about some lineup data and, uh, let's do it this way. So I went to cleaning the glass. Um, which is a fantastic site when it comes to, well, really any stat, but lineup data is really, really easy to, to parse there. Um, Would the Timberwolves have Cat and Rudy on the floor together? They have a net rating of, of, uh, of plus 15.1, which is really good. Plus 15.1 offensively. And and by the way, that's nearly 500 possessions. It's I think 482 possessions is what I have. So there are a plus five, did I say 15? It's actually a plus 5.1, which isn't as isn't as good as 15 as it turns out, but still a decent number, right? Together on the court, plus 5.1 net rating. Their offensive rating is 117.8, which is really good, 75th percentile. The defensive rating with Rudy and Kat together is actually 112.7, which is only 55th percentile. So 
the offense has actually been better than the defense when both Rudy and Cat have been on the floor together. And I've talked a lot already this season on the show about how Carl Anthony Towns has been good defensively. And I don't necessarily know that I'd also actually be curious to know what these numbers look like. I mean, the Phoenix game was such a, such a, uh, a trend buster for the majority of the season, right? Like you have the Atlanta game, you have the Phoenix game on one side, the other nine games on the other side where the wolves are great defensively. So this Phoenix game, I I'm be willing to bet already threw this number out of whack a little bit, but all that to say, it's still a plus 5.1, which is a good number. Um, and in terms of lineups overall, uh, where that, where that percentile wise, actually, I have that too. Let me pull it real quick. Um, because I think that gives some good context in terms of like, Oh, plus 5.1. That sounds good. Right. Uh, 5.1, which is 71st percentile among five man lineups that have played at least 15 possessions together this year, league wide. So 71st percentile it's fine. Right. But listen to how good this team has been with only one of the two on the floor. When Cat's on the floor and Rudy's off the floor, which is 253 possessions, so a little more than half of the possessions they've played together, the Wolves are a plus 13.5. They're 100, they have 116.6 offensive rating, which is 71st percentile, so a little bit worse than actually when they're on the floor together, which shocked me. I, it, like Again, small sample size, right? Like Who would have thought that Cat by himself with no Rudy, which, you know, I'm not, I'm not including Nas. So this isn't necessarily cat at center. This is cat on the floor with Nas or cat on the floor with other lineups with no Rudy. The offense is actually worse slightly than the, than it is with both of them on the floor. The defense though is actually really good with cat on the floor and Rudy off the floor. The Timberwolves have a 103.1 defensive rating so far this year, which is 97th percentile. That's, not what I was expecting to see. Um, and again, I think the Phoenix game did did impact because we're still so early in the season. I think it impacted it a fair amount. Again, going back to that net rating of plus 13.5, that's 94th percentile among five-man lineups so far this season. So a really, really strong lineup. If we flip that and we say Rudy on the court and Cat off the court, it's still a better lineup than when they're both on the floor together. Those numbers are a plus 9.5 overall, which is uh, 89th percentile. The offensive rating is not good. It's 101.7 points per possession per 100 possessions. I think I've been saying per possession. 101.7 points per 100 possessions, which is third percentile. Like, really not good. But the defense is astronomically good. 91.9 points per 100 possessions, 100th percentile. So uh, let me summarize this really quickly with Rudy on the floor and no cat. The wolves have effectively the best defense in the league and one of the worst offenses in the league with cat on the floor. No Rudy. They've still got a really good defense. The offense is above average when they're on the floor together. They've got an above average offense and a well above average defense or no, sorry, a really kind of a middle of the pack, slightly above average defense. I don't know that this tells us anything yet. Like there's no grand conclusion here other than that. I'm tracking it and it's super interesting. It's fascinating to me that the defense is better with one of them on the floor and not both of them. Maybe not fast. Fascinating might be strong because if you think about it, when one of them's off the floor, that means likely Kyle Anderson's on the floor and Kyle Anderson's length and mobility is, is at least the mobility piece of it is greater than that of either cat or Rudy. Um, Nas has been good defensively so far this year. We'll talk a little bit about him too. So, I mean, that goes back to what some of the the pessimism, some of the skepticism surrounding the two big lineup, what some of that was in the first place, right? How are you going to defend? How are you going to have Cat play defense on a four, right? Like, um, so, well, we're only 11 games in. I think that's really interesting to track. And there could be something to that. Now, that also, by the way, Chris Finch has staggered his lineups, I think, pretty brilliantly so far this year. I mean, Cat's played 253 possessions with no Rudy, and Rudy's played 242 possessions with no Cat. They played almost 500 possessions together. It's about perfect, right? Now, as the year goes on, perhaps he stag perhaps those overlaps widen, or I guess the overlaps shorten even a little bit more, and they just leave each of these guys on the floor at the five for longer. And Nas sees more minutes. Nas didn't play a whole lot the last couple of games. So we could see that shift a little bit as we get deeper into the season. I do want to talk briefly about Nas. And then I want to give two things that I think the Wolves could do like tomorrow, literally against the Pelicans 
to improve this offense that has been pedestrian at best. I think that's putting it pretty kindly to this point in the season. So uh, we'll do all that here next. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our friends over at BetterHelp. It's sponsored by BetterHelp. It's the holiday time of year, and uh, this time of year can certainly be a lot. It's natural to feel sadness or anxiety about it. I love the holidays, but um, sometimes when you know that there's just a lot of pressure with, I mean, you know all the stuff, right? Gifts and visiting lots of different people and trying to be in every place you possibly can be at once. Um, sometimes that can be tough, but adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot amid all the stress and change, especially this time of year. It's something to look forward to, something to make you feel grounded and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. I mean, taking care of yourself and considering therapy is a really important step that it could be really important for you. Um, I know that I've spent a lot more time considering all of the above in, in the last couple of years, really, you know, uh, I don't know, I'd say past two years or so, certainly post COVID uh, was kind of when that started being something I paid more attention to. And and if you're thinking about starting therapy, just give better help a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. You can find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash NBA. It's right there on your screen on YouTube today to get 10% off your first month. Again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P.com slash NBA. Today's show is also brought to us by our friends at Game Time. You should not have to worry when you're buying tickets to your next big event. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you with killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. If you are a last-minute ticket buyer or just simply put a procrastinator, which I am at times, certainly, um, Game Time is the place for you. Because you can get your last minute tickets with their flash deals. You can check out their zone deals, et cetera. You can see the view from your seat before you buy. So you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. And it's not just sports either. It's also music, comedy, theater, et cetera. You can also get those flash deals I mentioned and sponsor deals on tickets for all of the above. Sports, concerts, comedy, theater, you name it. They've got it with zone deals. You pick the section and game time picks the seats for an average of 18% savings. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use the code LOCKDOWNNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code LOCKEDONNBA. That's L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-B-A for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. I should point out our show, Locked On Wolves, was actually featured, I think it was Wednesday, late afternoon, early evening, on that national 24-7 channel uh, post the big win over the Warriors on Tuesday and also the the Draymond stuff. Um, so that was cool to be featured on that channel. We basically just run different locked on content uh, nationally 24 seven. It's, it's really kind of a cool deal. All right. Um, one last lineup piece of, I guess, nugget, uh, not piece of nugget. One last lineup nugget, Nas Reed, uh, 480 total Nas possessions this year. So this is just Nas on the court regardless of everything else. The Timberwolves have an offense that's only 110.8 points per 100 possessions. That's 33rd percentile. Not a very efficient offense. The defense, though, has a 100.6, has given up 100.6 points per 100 possessions. That's 99th percentile. So, Nas lineups actually fall in line with a lot of the other lineup combinations. Better on defense than on offense. Um, and, you know, we could we could drill down a bit further and talk about who's the better pairing, whether it's Nas with Rudy, Nas with Cat. And we will um, probably next week. I think we'll have Wolves play essentially every other day next week. So I think in between games, we'll definitely talk about that. Uh, but that's a pretty good segue into talking about the offense in general, because no matter how you slice it, other than the Cat only lineups and the Rudy only lineups, which have both been pretty good offensively, 
Um, there just hasn't been a whole lot of consistency in terms of the Timberwolves offense this year. And sitting here right now, post the Suns debacle on Wednesday, the Wolves have the 18th uh, best offensive rating in the NBA, according to basketball reference. They're still number one on defense, as I said. That means their net rating is fourth in the league. And of course, they've got essentially the fourth best record in the NBA. They're third in the Western Conference. But the offense is has been, as I said earlier, pedestrian at best. What are the biggest issues? Well, there's they really aren't doing anything extremely well. They're getting to the line at a decent clip. They're tenth in the league in free throw rate, which is which is good. Uh, they're averaging twenty three and a half free throw attempts per game, which is good. And they're middle of the pack in terms of free throw shooting. So that's all really good. Uh, they're not doing a whole lot else well. They're middle of the pack in offensive rebound rate, which is better than last year, but still middle of the pack. Uh, they don't turn it over all that much, which is good. Uh, they only turn it over like six times against the Suns Wednesday. So like in that sense, it was a little bit, you know, that they, they got crushed on Wednesday, right? Just they didn't turn it over, but it didn't really matter. Um, effective field goal percentage is okay. It's actually 12th league wide, 54 and a half percent in terms of effective field goal percentage. If you're not familiar, uh, basically that just uh, accounts. It takes into account that three pointers are worth more than two pointers. So they're weighted and matter more in that metric. So the Wolves are actually shooting the ball well from three-point range or decently well. They're right at league average. They're 35.8%. Last year, league average for an individual player was around 36% and actually happens to be 15th as a team so far this year. The problem, the biggest problem, though, is that they're not shooting enough threes. Well, I'm going to name two big problems. The two biggest problems are they're not shooting enough threes and they're not playing fast enough. The Wolves currently offensively have the 26th three-point attempt rate in the league which means for every, um, well, basically one in three of their shot attempts is a three-pointer from the field. 35% of their 35% of their total shot attempts from the field this year have been three-pointers. That's 26th in the league. That needs to be significantly higher. And, and this was a problem at times last year too, especially early in the season. Remember early last year, it was pretty similar. And of course the offense ended up not being very good last year anyway, they finished 15th in terms of three, actually 14th in terms of three point attempt rate. 38% of their shots last year were three pointers. This year, only 35%, and that ranks 26th in the league. Last year, we saw that skyrocket as the year went on. And that's got to happen again for the Wolves. Um, that's how Chris Finch wants to play. It's how they should play. When you've got somebody uh, essentially a 40%, you know, high 39% career three-point shooter in Carl Anthony Towns. Mike Conley's around 40% for his career. He's 45% this year. Um, Jaden McDaniels was a shade under 40% last year. He just hasn't got that many opportunities. Shake Milton hasn't shot that many threes. Uh, this team needs to shoot more three-pointers. And related to that is the transition offense needs to pick up in a big way. Um, and one of the areas you're going to get a lot of open threes is in transition. This isn't 1999. We're not just trying to get layups and dunks in transition. We're trying to get open threes in transition. Um, look at the Timberwolves offense from two years ago, two years ago, the Timberwolves had the number seventh offense in the league in terms of points per possession, which is essentially offensive rating or sorry, points per 100 possessions. According to cleaning the glass, it was the number seven offense in the league two years ago, 114.7 points per 100 possessions, right? Also two years ago, and a reminder, this is the Vanderbilt Beverly Wolves that ended up with Chris Finch as the coach midway through the season, took the Grizzlies to six games as a six seed versus the three in the first round of the playoffs two years ago. Number seven offense in the league in terms of points per possession. They were fifth in terms of transition frequency, which is just the number, the percentage of their possessions that started in transition fifth in the league two years ago. And they finished seventh in the league in offense. Uh, when it came to getting steals, they were getting into transition 70% of the time off of steals, which is not ranked number two in the league. When it came to live rebounds, they were a great defensive rebounding team three or sorry, they were not a great defensive rebounding team three years ago, but because of the way they were playing, they were still getting out in transition. They were ninth in terms of frequency of transition uh, possessions off of live rebounds. So across the board, this team got out and ran, they played at a fast pace and they were a good offensive team three years ago. Again, seventh in offensive efficiency, and they were first in pace two years ago. Okay. Last season, the Timberwolves were 23rd in offensive efficiency, and they were seventh in pace. But if you drill down even further, according to cleaning the glass, 
They were 18th in terms of transition frequency. So they dropped from fifth two years ago to 18th last year. The offense dropped from seventh to 23rd. The three-point rate dropped too, but it still finished middle of the pack. This year so far, they're 22nd in transition frequency. And they're 15th in offensive efficiency. So what's making up the difference? Because like, if you look at it, last year the offense was worse than it's been so far this year, and they were actually in transition a little bit more. But that's because so far this year, they've actually shot the ball pretty well from mid-range. They've gotten to the line a bunch. Like There's some things that we're still only 11 games in, right? Some of these sample sizes are going to even out. And I'm worried that the mid-range stuff, that could be a little a little bit fluky, right? That's not necessarily going to stick. All the Gobert lobs aren't necessarily going to be open all season long. Um, what's foolproof, though, is running. The more you run, the more open opportunities you're going to get. There's no question that playing fast just leads to more possessions, which leads to more points. And when you have efficient scores like the Wolves, um, that's a real thing, right? Like, I mean, obviously you could play fast and have a bunch of just awful basketball players and you would never score because you just weren't good. But if you have athletes and efficient scores like the Wolves do, the more possessions you get, the better. And that's why two years ago, Chris Finch said, hey, let's, uh, you know, let's blitz pick and roll. Let's get it. Let's jump passing lanes. Let's get out and transition because they didn't have the size to defend the rim or to rebound at a high clip, but they could generate turnovers and score in transition. And now this year, they're kind of trying to have it both ways. And while the opponent turnover rate's pretty good, they're actually forcing turnovers at a decent clip. They're not getting out and running. Off of steals this year, the Wolves are only running 65% of the time getting into transition. That's down 5% from two years ago, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's one or two times per game, basically, that they're not getting out in transition on a steal. When you lose a game by a couple buckets, that's the difference. So again, I'll say it one more time in a little bit of a different way. Two years ago, the Wolves were second in transition frequency off of steals. This year, they're 17th off of steals. Even though they're turning opponents over to a similar clip, not quite the same, but a similar clip, they're just not getting out and running. They were fifth in transition frequency two years ago. They're 22nd this year. They were seventh overall in offensive efficiency two years ago. They were 15th this year. They were 23rd at the end of last year. They need to get out in transition. And then that's going to lead to more open three-point attempts, which will obviously in turn drive your three-point attempt rate up. Your three-point attempt percentage will go up, especially if you're getting open threes in transition. It's a win all the way around. And those are things you can control. It's not just, hey, they need to start making shots. No, they just got to get out in transition and generate open shots, and then they will make more shots. It's not just simply they, you know, they have to run more of X play or they need to, um, they need so and so to just play better. It's not, it's not something like simply play better. It's just do the do more of this thing, which is get out and transition, and all the rest of the stuff takes care of itself. Um, now, certainly more three pointers in the half court would help. And, you know, we saw Finch draw some plays up for Cat to get some shots off in both Golden State and Phoenix, which was really good to see. Uh, so maybe we'll see some more of that. Maybe we'll see some. I would love to see. I know Shake is essentially facilitating running the point a lot of the time when he's on the floor, but I'd love to see a couple of plays for him to get a catch and shoot three to get him going a little bit offensively. Uh, we'll talk more about the bench next week, too. Hopefully by then, maybe between games Saturday and, you know, Monday night the Wolves bench could pick it up a little bit, but that all plays into it too, right? You need shake. You need to kill Alexander Walker. Those guys have to make threes. Nas Reed, who, who has made threes, um, but it's all connected and it starts with getting out in transition on both live rebounds, which I didn't even mention in terms of this year. They're actually 29th in running in transition off defensive rebounds because the Wolves are taking the ball to the net. And oftentimes it's Conley or it's ant kind of slowly cut up the court, setting up the offense. The Wolves aren't, like the heat, right? They shouldn't necessarily be doing that. Like just get out and run. Um, so transition needs to happen more often. It's going to lead to more open threes. That'll lead to improved offensive efficiency. It's all tied together. We need to see more of that, hopefully starting Saturday against the Pelicans. Uh, so something we'll keep an eye on here. We'll come back to at lockdown wolves over the course of the rest of the season. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about the Pelicans matchup and the upcoming schedule. We'll do all that here next. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our friends at Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. They are the easiest and most exciting way to play DFS. It's just you against the numbers. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you can pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. With the basketball season well underway now, you can pick 
combo projections across football and basketball from the Specials League, a league created specifically for combo projections that includes two or more players from different sports or leagues. For example, you could take LeBron James plus Travis Kelsey at a 10 and a half point combo of three pointers made and receptions, and you can take more than or less than that number. You could also play aside, play alongside some of Prize Picks favorite players like rapper Meek Mill, comedian Andrew Schultz, and more. You can find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries from some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use the code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Again, prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Prize picks daily fantasy sports made easy. All right, putting a bow on the show here today by talking Wolves, Pelicans. Of course, the Wolves beat the Pelicans just last Saturday, I think. Or was it, no, it was last Wednesday, a week and a half ago, so like 10 days ago. Um, since then, I mean, the Pelicans kind of sort of more the same, although they did win last time out. Z- they got off to a hot start this year. Remember, they were 4-1. and one. Zion missed the game in Minnesota due to personal reasons. They lost that game. It was their third straight loss at the time. They ended up with a five-game losing streak. And we're sitting at uh, four and six after that. Zion making the comments about um, basically his role in the offense. And, uh, you know, we all kind of know what he was saying there. They played the Mavericks twice in a row. They lost to them on, I think it was Sunday. And then they defeated the Mavericks the next time out by 21. They beat them 131 to 110. Jordan Hawkins, their rookie, has first round pick has been playing really well for them. Uh, obviously, we'll we'll he's somebody that we'll, we'll need to keep an eye on in this one. He's played heavy minutes ever since the CJ McCollum injury. We know there's no McCollum in this game. Uh, we know Jose Alvarado is still out, although he's probably going to come back soon, but he won't play in this one. Um, Larry Nance has been in and out of the lineup a little bit uh as well. So Pelicans still banged up. We anticipate Zion would play in this game. He's played in nine of the Pelicans' 11 games so far. One of the two he missed was that Wolves game. So I think it's fair to anticipate he'll be he'll be at the game. He'll play for the Pelicans. He had 19, 19 7 and 5 against Dallas uh last time out. And the Pelicans as a team, they haven't been very good on either end of the floor so far this season, but they were 52% shooting against Dallas, 37% from three. Of course, old friend Matt Ryan comes off the bench for them, a two-way player. Uh the Wolves always tend to struggle with Jonas Valanciunas, so of course, somebody to keep an eye on, but you go down the line in terms of their stats so far this year, other than playing really fast and drawing fouls, which they do well, uh, they're top 10 in both pace and free throw rate. There's not a whole lot else that stands out about what they've been doing. They're shooting threes at a similar clip to the wolves. Um, slight, they're shooting slightly more and making slightly less in terms of percentage. And, you know, Zion's getting to the line a bunch, but he's shooting a career low right now from the line, 59% free throws. He just hasn't been all that impressive when he's been on the floor. He's only got six and a half rebounds per game. Uh, the field goal percentage is good. He's hasn't made a three pointer yet this year. Not that that's ever been a huge part of his game, but it just, it's not all there right now for Zion or for the Pelicans. It's certainly a game. The Wolves should win. There's no line yet on FanDuel for this one, uh, because it's not until Saturday. Today's Friday. So, um, you know, go check that out. I would imagine the Wolves will be favored, even though it's on the road by a couple of points. Um, and also with two days rest. Oh, that's the other thing is the Pelicans play tonight. They play Friday night. So this will be the second half of a back-to-back for the Pelicans. The Wolves will have a massive rest advantage, having not played since Wednesday. And uh, for all intents and purposes, the Wolves are healthy. So um, the Wolves should be favored in this game. They absolutely should win. They should be able to match the Pelicans' pace. The Pelicans are going to try and push pace. The Wolves should be able to match it. And of course, they won that last time out, you know, Wolves Pelicans fairly easily. In that game, Ant had 26 points, eight assists, and three steals. It was a really, really good Ant game, um, other than missing a bunch of threes. He was fantastic. Cat was also really good. This was kind of the start of, remember, this was the game after the Boston win when Cat was very quiet. Um, and then that Wednesday against the Pelicans, he dropped 23 on nine of 12 shooting, four or five on threes. And was fantastic. Gobert at 17 and 21. This was just one of the more well-rounded, one of the few like true blowout wins that the Wolves have had. Um, it was probably Shake Milton's best game too. He had 10 and four in that one. So um hopefully a repeat performance for Minnesota. It it's gonna be different if assuming Zion's on the floor, of course, but certainly a winnable game for the Wolves and one that they should win. And it really like, especially coming off the heels of how bad the loss to Phoenix was Wednesday. I know schedule loss, the whole thing. But it was just, it's, they should have a bad taste in their mouths and they should be able to kind of wash that out here with the Pelicans. 
Um, in terms of the upcoming schedule, I'll throw it up there. If you're watching on YouTube, the Wolves after the Pelicans on Saturday, uh, they have the the Knicks at home on Monday night. They'll get to see Tom Thibodeau in the flesh at Target Center. And then they're on this every other um, day. They play a game schedule for a while. No double off days, no back-to-backs. The Wolves don't play another back-to-back for a month. It's like the week before Christmas is the next time they have a back-to-back. Uh, so, And also a nice three-game homestand here. So at the Pelicans Saturday, they come home after the five-game road trip. Knicks, Sixers, Kings next week. All difficult games. All very likely playoff teams. And then at the Grizzlies, who, of course, have had a terrible start to the season and are all kinds of banged up and and no jaw on the whole thing. That is, I believe, a week from Sunday. Um, so not an easy schedule, right? Like that's a that's a difficult next five games, all you know, thought to be playoff teams before the season. Although who knows what the Pels and the Grizzlies at this point, but um, not an easy stretch. It just it hasn't been easy for the Wolves so far this year. And here's hoping, you know, over those five games, I think three and two is the most likely scenario, but four and one's not out of the question. The Wolves simply play like how they have for nine of the 11 games so far this year. They should win at least three, if not four of these games. All right. That's all we have for you today here on the show. Of course, the Wolves play Saturday night. There will be a live postcast at Lockdown Sports Minnesota. Uh, I believe it'll be Jack. I don't know who's hosting Saturday. It could be me. It might be Sam. Um, So check it out. Uh, again, Locked On Sports Minnesota on YouTube. We'll do that live, and then the audio will be right here on the uh, on the Locked On Wolves audio feed after the fact. So check this out on Saturday night or Sunday, this feed, and you'll hear that that postcast that we do live. And then I'll be back on Monday. We'll do something of a post-game pod on Monday as well, given the game Saturday. And then we'll also preview Monday night's game um, against the, uh, who did I say they play Monday? The Knicks? Yeah, the Knicks. So um, all of that here in the next few days so be sure you're following and subscribe to lockdown wolves wherever you like to listen to podcasts you can also watch on youtube and also the lockdown sports minnesota youtube excuse me lockdown sports minnesota app on both roku and amazon fire tv you can follow the show on x at lockdown t wolves and also at b beacon that's two b's two e's c k e n a reminder on saturday you can listen to the broadcast as the timberwolves play the pelicans on Sirius XM, on the SXM app, you can hear the hometown call with the fantastic Alan Horton, the play-by-play voice of the Wolves. Again, that's the SXM app. Just search Minnesota Timberwolves. Of course, the Lockdown Wolves podcast is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your local experts on all the biggest stories. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.